All right. So, uh, yeah. So let me talk. I want to. I want to make the the main topic of the talk. The unifying topic is to understand the response of uh, to discuss responses of systems, typically nonlinear. Uh, to inputs, uh, and I want to focus on things that are qualitative features that are specific to nonlinear systems, and how the role of network structure constrains the kind of behaviors you can get. Uh, and I was motivated in this work by a number of subjects in biology, going from molecular biology to epidemics, uh, the you know, socioeconomic level, uh, but also lately about some questions in um, machine learning. So I'll, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, the so the main point that I, oh yeah, so I'll, I'll say that. So the main point I want to uh, sort of start with is to say that we are using control theory, for those of you that have control theory, feedback control, we're used to looking at problems like tracking or stabilization where we, our objective is usually an asymptotic map. We want that as t goes to infinity, something interesting happens. But what I want to emphasize is that the transients matter, right? And an example, that I'm not going to talk about this at all, but just to give you an idea, uh, one of the most important uh, proteins involved in the progression of cancer is P53, and it's been discovered a long time ago that the transient response is to some sort of stress in a cell, uh, whether there are sustained oscillations or there are single spikes or there is some sort of constant response, and the frequency of those, uh, those transient responses affect whether a cell is going to go into apoptosis and kill itself, is it going go into some sort of cell cycle arrest, and so forth. So, uh, more related to things that I've been working on, um, I got interested, as everybody else, uh, in modeling epidemics and COVID in the, in the last few years. And one of the things that uh, is interesting is that if you take the simplest models, say the SIR model in epidemics that many of you may know, uh, in that context, you know that eventually all the infectives are going to go to zero. This is assuming that there's no reinfection possible that you did our immunity. So, uh, you can modify this. Thing. So you know that eventually the, the infections are going to go to zero. That's not a problem. So this is a number of infectives. It's a, essentially, it's going to go to zero. But what we really care about in that context is not what happens eventually. We care, for example, that the capacity of the hospital emergency rooms is not you know, saturated. So you really care something like you know, the, the, an infinity norm, right? You, you care that, that the maximum of the, of the I of T, meaning the number of infectives, doesn't go over a certain threshold. So, you know, people use, in the newspapers, right, they'll talk about flattening the curve, right? Which means, basically, this will be bad, right? The number of infectives was more than, say, the capacity of the, of the hospitals. And, uh, and what's interesting is you can look at that system and think of it as a system in which there's this parameter beta, which is uh, related to how transmissible the disease is, and you can think of that as a control parameter that you can tweak in order to say, by for instance, making people stay home and introducing NPIs, non-progressive interventions, like saying, you know, you should stay at home and don't go to work or don't go to supermarkets or whatever. And one thing that I want to point out, we've been writing a whole bunch of papers about this thing, so one thing I want to point out, because this will come up a number of times, is as you uh, increase the, say, say you increase the transmissivity uh, rate, then you're going to increase the number of infectives, but you're also going to have less people who are susceptible, because the susceptibles became infected. So there's less people left to be infected. The susceptibles, in turn, the more you have, the more infectives you have. So you have this kind of what is called an incoherent feedforward loop. You have this kind of where the beta is affecting S negatively, but S affects I positively, but beta also affects I positively in a direct way. I'll get back to, to, to this in a different way. I just want to point out this, because right. it also appears in many other cases. One of the areas of work that so I've been working on. So yes. This, uh, this diagram might be the standard I don't know what it means. Like the bar means that it's affecting, affecting negatively. Is that what yeah, yeah, yeah. Mean? I'll get back to that in a minute. This is like a negative arrow. Yes, it's okay. those are diagrams. In biology, typically you draw one of these blunt arrows slash dash v in LaTeX, uh, and, and actually it's a, it's a um, uh, it means that it's a negative effect. I'll get to that in a few minutes. Yeah, and this is not being rigorous. This is just trying to set up sort of the intuition. So. Uh, in a similar way, you had the same diagram here, the same, the same notation. Uh, I, one other topic I've been very interested in, we've been doing a, a bunch of work on this um, in various journals, has to do with, say, the effect of chemotherapy, uh, when you uh, keep in mind that the immune system is there. So, for example, when you apply a chemotherapy drug, not only do you kill the cancer, but typically you also kill uh, some of the immune cells that in turn would have killed the cancer. Okay, so, so fast dividing immune cells get killed. So now we have a situation in which 
they say view is the amount of drug, the drug is killing the cancer, but it's also killing the immune system, which in turn would have killed, here's a lot of negatives, right, negative arrows, we in turn would have sort of brought down the cancer through some immunological effects. So you have that say this path is a positive path, right, because you're a negative, negative, the net effect is positive, but here you are negative. So again, you have this kind of inco or it's called incoherent form of things that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so, um, so that's, you know, another kind of thing where, you know, basically the coherent form of these, what they do is to sort of, they will sort of adapt to constant signals asymptotically, everything will go to, will, will sort of be, behave like a nonlinear version of an integral feedback controller, so to speak, but, but you can have trans, you have many little things that are your bearing. Another example, uh, just to pick from things that I did in my work, and I won't have time to talk about this either, but has to do with the, um, uh, the fact that, um, uh, that a tumor cell or any kind of antigen presentation, it could be some sort of infectious cell, uh, will tend to create an immune reaction. These are the CD8 cells, the cytotoxic T cells. And, but they also tend to engage cells that will tend to regulate negatively the, uh, the effect of these cytotoxic T cells. So again, I'm being just very, very, you know, just to give you a little bit of general motivation picture of things, but here again, we have this kind of idea with this antigen presentation, something is so in, uh, exciting the immune system, is exciting the immune system directly, but it's also exciting things within t which then tend to repress the immune system. And again, you'll get, you know, with appropriate math math mathematization of these things, you'll get that uh, the systems also tend to adapt. You tend to have that a step change, for example, in this antigen presentation will give rise to some sort of uh, peaked type of response. So we'll, we'll get into all this a uh, little mathematically. I just want to point out that these things are actually quite relevant. For example, in the latest, in the, probably the best modern kind of uh, therapies nowadays are immune checkpoint uh, uh, therapies for cancer. And it is well understood, it's understood now by, for eight years, that these kinds of therapies tend to lead to a response which actually gets worse. This is actually from a uh, particular from a rice cancer, or uh, cat cancer, uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, so the, the, the cancer may actually grow before it goes down. So in fact, when you actually look at what's happening, you're happening that during therapy, uh, the response of the patient seems that they're getting worse, but eventually they get better. And in fact, the recommendation to doctors is there's going to be some interesting dynamics. Basically, that's what they're saying. They're actually telling the doctors, you're going to get worried, the patient's getting a little bit worse, uh, but in fact, they're going to get better if this works, right? Uh, and you should, you should sort of be aware of the fact that it's going to be, you know, let's think of it as some sort of second order dynamics at least, okay? So these things are actually important in practice. There's all kinds of feedback loops inside cells that may, that may, uh, that may affect that. So let's get a little mathematical. So I'm going to be considering systems in the usual sense that we do control theory to remind you. Uh, we'll have, say, ordinary differential equations. We can look at PDEs, we we'll look at delay equations, wherever you want. But let's say we look at ODEs. So we have a system of ODEs, just as usual. But we're going to have, in addition to that, we're going to have inputs and outputs. Okay? So I think in this audience, it's probably not needed to remind you of this, but inputs are things that you can manipulate that could be disturbances, could be controls, could be noises of certain types that are going to affect the system. And we also have some variables that we, that we can observe. So sort of maybe, typically, maybe you can observe one of the variables, or some linear combination of variables, or whatever. Just that's not really controversy. So, one of the interesting, uh, so I'm going to give you a little four vignettes, depending on how much time I have to cover all of them. Uh, the first one has to do with the understanding how the structure, the sign structure of a network affects things. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask the following thing. I'm going to assume that the Jacobian entries, the off-diagonal Jacobian entries in my ODE, uh, have the property that this sign doesn't change over this thing. So if the values may change, but this sign doesn't change. So, uh, and I can talk later about that assumption, but uh, it's typically satisfied the most interesting models. In any case, we're going to say that a variable, active, variable J activates a variable I if the Jacobian entry for the ith entry of the vector field, the partial derivative of that respect to xj is positive, then we say it activates. If, it, if that Jacobian entry is negative, we're going to say that xj inhibits xi. Is that clear now? And, and then, the, and then the, uh, we, we, you know, we draw these arrows when it's a negative Jacobian entry. Is that okay now? Okay. So, uh, and similarly for inputs, so we get a signed uh, di directed graph. Uh, and then uh, the things I was showing you before were these incoherent feedforward loops where I may have, there's no feedback loops, but there's a feedforward structure where, for instance, I have a positive negative effect because it's a negative and positive, a positive and negative effect, for example, from 
from this node to this node here, but I also have a positive, sorry, I have a negative effect this way, I have a positive effect this way, or you could have coherent loops, or uh, the same, sometimes we call this incoherent loops. Uh, a coherent loop is one in which it doesn't matter which path you take, you always have the same parity, the same net parity. Okay, so there's no ambiguity, you know which path you take, and you could do the same thing with feedbacks. Okay, so incoherent, uh, and more generally, feed forward loops are a very important structure in, uh, in biology, for example. It's understood that a lot of uh, this is just an example of a, a transcriptional network in, in bacteria, but this is being found in many, many uh, species and at many levels, whether it's metabolism or, or gene regulatory networks or you know, protein, protein interaction networks. One finds that typically there are a lot of this feedback of this feed forward loops with coherent or incoherent. So, just to give an idea, these things are actually quite interesting. And one theorem that we proved with David and Jenny a while back was that uh, if you have a system in which when you apply an input, which is increasing or decreasing, but it's sort of monotonically either increasing or decreasing, if it happens that some state coordinate, and more generally some output, but let's say some state coordinate is non-monotonic, then there has to be inside the system, and you know, I'm not writing all the epsilon and some delicacy here, but there are theorems, okay? But the theorem basically says that when you look at that system, there has to be necessarily either an incoherent feed forward loop or an incoherent uh, or a negative or incoherent uh, uh, same thing, uh, feedback. So there has to be either one of those incoherent things or negative things, whether it's feed forward loop or, or feedback loop. Uh, and that's, that's a theorem. And the good thing about this is that it helps sort of to do a little bit of modeling validation to give an example. This was a paper, there was two papers. One paper appeared in PNA, Proceeding National Academy of Sciences, 2003, looking at the stress response of tuberculosis uh, asylum. Uh, uh, under lack of oxygen, under hypoxia, and there's a lot in this slide, but the important thing is the input is this red, you know, this red plot with some error bars, but it's a clearly monotonic input, and the output as measured by the expression of a particular gene is actually, has this biphasic, this sort of up and down structure, it's non-monotonic. Therefore, we know that there must exist either a negative feedback in there or an incoherent feed forward loop. However, the mechanism that was suggested in the literature in a paper a few years later was this one in here, in which the only, the only feed forward loops that there are is a positive feed forward loop, otherwise you have this cascade, but there is no negative feedback, no negative uh, uh, feed forward loop either. So that you know, means that the two are inconsistent. Right? So you have the experimental results, you have the model that was proposed in the Journal of Bacteriology, obviously the two are inconsistent given the mathematics. Okay? So that led us in the other paper that we already in the Journal of Biology to look at other possible mechanisms and you know, experiments and how can you fix this. Um, another um, example along the same lines is suppose we look at things like uh, the adaptation problem. So we know that uh, we tend to sort of stop paying attention to things after a while. The speaker is very monotonous for this guy ignoring what they're saying and whatever, right? You don't feel your clothes after a while and things like that, right? So, uh, this in biology, there's a huge number of systems that are adapting. In fact, that's sort of the norm of systems that tend to be adapting because we need to, we want to detect change, okay? That's a really important thing. When the refrigerator turns off, that's what you know. It's not when the refrigerator goes on all the time, right? So, detecting change means that when the change happens, you're going to have a signal that goes maybe up and up, and then it will go down again to some default value. So that means that the system has to have inside some incoherent feed forward loop or some negative feedback loop. Okay, that's, you can write down as a definition what you mean by adaptation, and you will see that that will necessarily imply that you, that you have one of these non monotonic responses. So now you say, okay, well, that's sort of interesting. So, but the theorem only tells me that there's either an incoherent feed forward loop or an incoherent. A feedback loop, but which of the two do I have, right? How do you distinguish between them? And we had another paper uh, with Anne Rahi, who's now at the EPFL in, in Lausanne, uh, where we proved the following fact. We showed that if you have adaptation, right, so we know there's either an IF, you know, coherent feed forward loop, coherent feedback loop, then in fact, uh, if now we test the system with some periodic input and we have a subharmonic response, and I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that. If there's a subharmonic response to that, then in fact we have to have a negative feedback, not a, not a feed forward loop, but not a coherent feed forward loop, but in fact a coherent feedback loop, because a coherent feed forward loop will never give you uh, subharmonic responses. And by the way, there are proofs used in contractions uh, to, 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 to get rid of the coherent feed forward loop. We have one proof of, with that and a different proof that's all in the paper. Anyway. So, so then you say, well, uh, can we do an experiment with this? What well, he did. And uh, 
And uh, the, the, you know, without getting into the technical details, uh, there was an experiment that was done trying to understand the response of a worm to certain kinds of odors, okay? So the worm has like a nose, and it's just, it doesn't have a nose, the receptors that, 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 uh, that detect odors in the environment, and there were two alternative um, architectures that were being suggested. Uh, one involved an incoherent feedforward loop, one in involved a, a negative feedback loop, and by applying through a you know, fancy microfluidics uh, experiment, by applying, uh, in fact, a certain pulsatile inputs of a uh, period of 20 seconds, he found that, in fact, you get periods of 200 seconds in the, in the, uh, in this, in the, in the response. Okay? This is actually an actual experimental trace. Okay? So the, the, the period got multiplied by 10, which means that, in fact, the frequency got divided by 10. Okay, so you get a cyberharmonic response, which then rules out and at least provides mathematical uh, weight to the idea that they should have the negative feedback, the negative feedback, and not the feedforward uh, 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 loop in their being response. Okay, so it just gives you one way to try to uh, to understand various things. Another topic which was related to this is that one of the um, that goes back to the work of uh, Feshner at the beginning of. Uh, uh, sorry, Ernst Weber at the beginning of uh, psychophysics, which was he uh, realized that we tend to uh, notice uh, relative changes. So if somebody starts putting weights uh, and you start, say, at 1 kilo, you may notice at 1 kilo 200. When you start at 10 kilos, you may notice at, 10 ki uh, at, 12, uh, at 12 kilos, right? Let's say 10, 12, okay? 20% more. So you notice percentage changes, and you know, we hear, you know, we quantify decibels we're hearing and things of that sort. So, um, so the question is, uh, why is this of any relevance in things like biology? Well, for example, suppose that you have a system uh, that compo that's composed of two systems, some sort of external stimulus passes through a first system that has some sort of parametric uncertainty. And I'll tell you in a second what that could be, but let's say this is a parameter P. And what happens is that as the signal goes through here, this input gets scaled by this number P. And then suppose, however, that we notice that the response of the system is actually independent of this number p. Well, if the system reacts in the same way to two scaled versions of the same signal, right, then of course we're going to get the same response. Because we multiply by p, but then this second system is ignoring what happens, only cares about the difference in scale, only cares about the proportions. So uh, a particular example of that that I'll, I'll mention in a second comes from experiments has to do with the case in which you have some sort of external signal that activates a certain protein, and uh, that protein is a transcription factor, it's something that would lead to expression of a certain gene or repression of a certain gene, uh, expression of a certain gene. And basically because, you know, with a simple modeling, you can think of this as some sort of linear system where you have this parameter P that is not really the input, but you could think of it as an input for purposes of this. What's going to happen is that as this P changes, you're going to have that U actually gets multiplied by P in your solution. Right? It's a linear system, so you have linear scaling. So if the downstream system acts in the same way for any two signals that are multiplied by only different, uh, different proportions and scales, you're going to get that the net result of this excitation by the system is going to be, is going to be the same. And in fact, what motivated this work was work by Gantor and Kishner in Harvard Medical School in 2010, in which they, uh, 2008 I think it was, uh, nine, sorry, in which they have this particular circuit that, um, that, that is expressed in cancer and also in development. And uh, there's this, basically this, um, the, the, the uncertainty in P comes from the fact that you have different cells of the same type. The amount of protein that you have is intermediate protein. In this case, it's not terribly important for this audience, obviously, but it's got a bit of in it. But with this, pro this protein may be in different concentrations. And what happens is that if you follow the argument that I did before very, very quickly, the signal that goes into the nucleus will be a scaled version of what you have before. The scale depends on the amount of protein that you had. However, they find that from at both gene expression and in terms of phenotype of the actual, um, um, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was frog eggs, uh, embryos, uh, you get actually the same phenotype in this case. So there is this type of, 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 uh, of uh, thing going on in there, of process going on of scale invariance. So let me try to define this a little bit better. So if I have a system that adapts, okay, if I have a system that is perfectly adapting, uh, then a, and suppose that, you know, think of a linear system with zero DC gain, for example, okay? Perfect, 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 per
Uh, so if you have a system that has that, in general, if I put in, for instance, a step, you know, something like a sequence of steps like this, I'm going to have, you know, adaptation. That's fine if the time scale is long enough. Okay, but sorry, it's this picture in here. I'm going to go over. So you'll have some sort of adaptation, but the height of the peaks will, of course, be proportional. You know, in the linear system, will be proportional to you, right? In general, there's no reason they should all be the same, of course. Um, and uh, also, the time of adaptation will change in the nonlinear system, in particular, will change, right? Depending on you know, did you go from U1 to U2, or did you go from U2 to U3, and so forth. And this happens even if the ratios between U2 over U1, U3 over U2, U, et cetera, U4 over U3, and so forth are the same. In what we call a scale invariant system, a scale invariant system is one in which if you do that kind of experiment, you'll actually get the exact same picture every time, okay? So what that says is that if you apply two inputs, okay, this is an input U of T, this is an input which is a scale version of that by some factor p. The red one is, say, I don't know, what is it, two times your t in this picture or something. Uh, you would like to have the same output. Okay? So uh, I'm going to give you very quickly a theorem that says, and it applies more generally than just for scalings. It applies for arbitrary groups of symmetries in the input space. In this case, we've just been multiplying by a positive real number. Uh, and I'll call a system p invariant with respect to you know, such a class of transformations. If you get the same output, if you get the same output for u and p times u, and I'll, I'll mention a general theorem and also some predictions for uh, uh, for bacterial motion and confirmation of that. So, what is what do I mean by uh, so? How do we study this problem? So, one theorem uh, which we published with Uri Alon and others, but uh, and, 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 and Cheval, uh, and the proof in detail is in this paper in the same journal of applied dynamical systems. And, a few years ago. Uh, basically, one way to certify this input output invariance is to say that there should exist a change of coordinates in the input space that is consistent with the dynamics and with the output. And that's sort of obvious. Okay, if you think about it, you know that the control theory is sort of obvious, right? It's like we have to we have two linear systems that are equivalent and under similarity, then of course they have the same input output behavior, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's pretty obvious. What's interesting is that for arbitrary nonlinear systems, you actually prove the contrast. So it's like a conversely atomic theorem kind of thing, but it's not the point, there's no stability, right? But it's the fact that a theorem says that if you have input output invariance, then there is you can witness it, you can certify it using one of these uh, equivariances, and, and basically those equi finding those equivariances is equivalent to solving a certain system of first order uh, quasi linear PD. It's just this sort of standard. I mean the, the the fact that it's equivalent to that infinitesimal formulation is, is trivial, uh, but actually proving that invariance implies the existence of these rows is actually fairly complicated. And that's actually proof that uses some nonlinear control theory, the realization theory from the 1970s even. But, uh, but applying it in this case was sort of interesting. So uh, just to give an example, this is, here's two incoherent free forward loops. They both have this structure. In this case, u is affecting directly the production of x in a positive way, affecting the production of y in a positive way, x, but x is degrading y. In this case, x is actually uh, negatively affecting the production of y. So if you look at the equations, uh, this, the, the main point I want to make in here is that here the derivative of y, this y dot derivative of y, depends on u, uh, but also is degraded in a way that depends on x, right? This is the degrading term, right? The, 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 the degradation term, and it is a term that depends on x. While in this second example, x appears in the production term, okay? As a negative term in the production term. Assume, x is, assume that x is always, uh, we're working on the positive order. Okay, so zero is not there. Uh, and here's a negative, uh, what's called a, a nonlinear integral feedback loop. It's not a linear integral feedback, it's a nonlinear integral feedback loop. And one can prove by finding a very simple equivariance, just multiply x by p and leave y invariant, multiply by one, you can prove that this, in fact, this system and, and this system are both scale invariant. But this first system actually has no scale invariant with respect to any. Uh, group of um, a, any non-trivial group, which is sort of interesting. And what's interesting also is both are both are uh, incoherent free forward loops. And if you read, for instance, Uri Alon's book, both would be described by this picture. But it turns out that when you, whether physically what you're having is repression of production or enhancement of degradation, you actually get completely different transient behaviors. Okay, and eventually everything you know adapts, but you get different transient behaviors. So by looking at transient behaviors, you can distinguish within the two systems. So, uh, well, I'm not going to go to this, but 
you can see later in the, in the recording, there's uh, some technical details. I have to assume the dynamics are analytic, not just the infinity. I have to assume the accessibility run condition and so forth. Uh, but uh, but let, me, let me just quickly go over this. So the uh, application of chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is a movement in response to chemical gradients, right? It has an important role to play in everything from us to moving towards the smell of lunch is to perhaps more experimentally interesting the movement of bacteria or how cancer cells migrate in certain environments and so forth. Um, and the best study system for that is bacteria chemotaxis. Bacteria tend to move in a stochastic, doing a stochastic gradient search, uh, E. coli bacteria. Uh, what they do is they will sort of do sort of a random search. When they think life is good, they'll keep moving in that direction. But they have some doubts because it could be noisy, so every so often they will reorient a little bit, they will move again, but if things are not so good, they'll reorient again, they move again. So in that way, they perform a stochastic gradient, or ascent, because, well, yes? What functional minimize? What functional minimize? That's a very interesting question. So, uh, they are trying to move in the direction of the source of the food, let's say. So assume that there's some sort of, you know, a source of uh, chemicals in that are there, and it's diffusing, and I'm, what I want to do is I want to move in the direction of maximizing the amount of, you know, looking at the source. So to, assuming some Gaussian, for instance, and I'm looking for the center of the Gaussian, okay? I'll actually show a picture of that in a second. Although I don't have time to go through it. But what I want to say is that there is a well-defined, this is one of the best studies in systems in biology, there's a beautifully well understood uh, biochemical pathway, there are equations for that, and we actually showed that there's an equivariance for this set of equations. Um, which is given in this way, okay? There are three variables in the differential equations that describe the system pretty well, and there's this particular logarithmic equivariance, and then within a year there was a, uh, a, uh, an experimental results, actually here at MIT, uh, by, the group, uh, by the group of Roman Stoker, uh, showing that, and this is really fascinating, so this L is the input, and it ranges over, over three orders of magnitude, but they're rescaled versions of each other, this is FRET measurements, doesn't matter what it is, but the important thing is to the eye, they look exactly like the same response, okay? Every time you took a step, even though it's over many different orders of magnitude, you get the exact same response, which, which is co consistent with, you know, what we're saying, that you have this scaling variant behavior. Uh, let me, the one on the right, it's, it's even more interesting, but it's over less scale. Uh, similarly, uh, we actually looked at um, other kind of bacteria, Rhodobacter, uh, we actually studied that circuit a couple of years later. It's a more complicated circle. We also proved scale invariance, and in a companion paper published back to back with ours, a group at Oxford actually verified the predictions that we made mathematically. So that was sort of interesting. So my students, my eschatarians, we said, hey, let's apply this to other things. For instance, uh, a eukaryotic system, not a bacterial system. Uh, this is slime molds, it doesn't matter the details, but the point is. We, we proved mathematically that for a paper that had been published in the literature, uh, you have this scale invariance. So we actually went back to the authors and said, can you do this scale invariance results? And we're really cool, you know, now we're going to prove that this worked. And they came back and they said, no, as a matter of fact, it didn't work. So conclusion, the mathematics was right, right? Uh, for a moment, I thought we did something wrong in the math. The math, we checked, it was all right. What happened is that the actual model that had been published in the literature was not correct, at least in that range of O equals. So, it's sort of interesting that it gives you again a way of saying that a certain model in the literature cannot be right, just by using some very simple mathematics. Uh, yeah, you know, I was going to talk about this, but I'm running out of time, so I'll get back to this if you want later. This actually has the sensing, the, the, the Gaussian sensing, and there's a stochastic version of this that I can tell you about later, uh, but I'll have to skip that because uh, there'll be no time. So I want to get into something completely different because we started a little late, but I don't want to go too much over. You said I could go over, right? But um, well, maybe I will, maybe I'll do it. If I can go over a little bit, then I'll tell you very quickly about this. So, uh, so basically, uh, because you asked me, I, I'm doing this because you asked me the question. So, suppose that actually uh, I want to, I, I, I want to really, now the experiments I showed you before are very deterministic in a sense. They're better cells, and you just give them ligands and see how they work. But what about if I actually look at the whole stochastic movement? So, as I said, Basically, what's going to happen is this bacteria making random decisions to reorient. These random decisions are a function of a parameter. Uh, and basically, they're a Poisson random. You can think of it in some sense. It's pretty accurate. They're sort of Poisson. It's a, they, they decide to turn 
with a Poisson rate that depends on a parameter, which is in fact something called QYP. It's a, the Poisson rate deformance of the protein inside the cell. So you have an ODE that's giving you a model inside the cell, and that's in turn the rate of a non-homogeneous uh, 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 Poisson, the Poisson process rate. Uh, that is not homogeneous, and that decides when I'm going to make a turn or not. You can write the actual, you can write the actual uh, Fokker-Planck equations for that. We have this in a paper. It's it's really very simple, and you can show that you get a scaling invariant search. In other words, if the, if the field now is scaled, you actually follow things in time, and they will actually do the same thing. And that was a prediction, and in fact, it was again an experimental validation a year later. Uh, by the Gorsi Mitsu in the Netherlands, and basically just to show you an idea, these are graphs of what happens with the distribution of bacteria in a microfluidics channel after one minute, 17 minutes, sorry, nine minutes, 17 minutes, 37 minutes, and this is over three orders of magnitude of concentrations that are scaled to each other, but you see that the histograms basically are the same, they're almost completely on top of each other, which means that the search is basically well the same, okay? So, uh, but now let me talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of um, things related to completely different things, but also the effect, the effect of inputs as we'll see. So, suppose that we want to, so forget about biology now, completely forget about biology, let's talk about uh, numerical analysis. So, suppose that we want to optimize a function, okay, um, uh, and we either have a discrete time or a continuous time optimization technique. Let's start later, I will briefly mention uh, normalized uh, uh, Riemannian gradients and a number of other things, but let's say we just look at gradient systems. So suppose we want to <coughs> we want to find a system whose solution asymptotically is that it approaches the minimum, okay, some solution of an optimization problem. Okay, a bunch of you here have talked to today, working on such things. And suppose that we simply look at the, nor at the, nor at the gradient flow. So L is some loss function, and we look at the gradient flow, you know, eta is some learning rate, that's my little, you can take it to be one if you want. So if we just use L, this is totally standard. I'm not saying anything that is surprising to anybody. Okay, so if you look at the if you look at the um, at L as a Lyapunov function, then of course the derivative of L with respect to time, you know, will be just the gradient of L dot product, you know, x dot, and then x dot is this. So you multiply out, you get negative eta times the norm square of the gradient. Right? This is totally standard. So you know, last time invariance principle, whatever. You know, you're converging to the set of points where the gradient is zero. Um, and in particular, for instance, if the gradient is only zero at one point, then we know we have convergence, or in the results that you know, you're just telling me, you get the set of global equilibrium connected by global equilibrium, whatever you know, new contraction results. Uh, you can, of course, and I'm going to be talking about the flow, but of course, if you take the Euler approximation of a flow, you get the standard the steepest descent, right? I mean, usually there will be a step size there, which I'm taking to be one. Okay. So, now let me get to what I think might be a little bit more interesting for some of you. Uh, so we have that L dot is negative gradient square, okay? Negative normal gradient square. And now, uh, I think a lot of people here know the polyadoptivity inequality, right? It's a standard thing in non-convex non optimization nowadays. But let me remind you, the polyadoptivity inequality says that you have a gradient dominance condition. It says that if the gradient is small, then the, the value should, the, or the function should also be small. And to be more precise, it says that the gradient square, it, I mean, it's a condition, it doesn't have to be true, in fact, it won't be true in many cases, but that the gradient, that the norm of the gradient squared is bigger or equal than some constant times the value of the function. I'm assuming here that the, the function is minimized at zero just for simplicity, okay? Otherwise, you'll have L minus, you know, L minus L of the minimum, okay, minimum L. Uh, and now I'm calling this the global polyelectricity inequality because usually, even though this is sort of in the small print, Usually, the polyelectricity inequality is only proved in sub-level sets of the given function. This is getting more technical, but basically, it's only proved on compacts. Okay, and we'll see why that's important in a minute. It doesn't seem important, but it will be important. Uh, but let's just, for simplicity, assume that I have this global locality inequality. Well, clearly, if I have this thing up here, right, that I'm showing to you, then if I have this inequality, then negative the gradient square is less or equal than negative lambda. So even if you miss the rest you see that we get a differential inequality, L dot less or equal than negative lambda L, which means that we have exponential convergence to zero, right? Okay, so this is a standard way in numerical analysis. This is like the one minute version of what people do nowadays in convergence analysis of, of in, one of the things they do in non-convex non optimization, okay? Uh, and by the way, the uh, strict convexity implies a polyallocative inequality, okay? But you don't need convexity for polyallocative. So, uh, so that's all cool. 
But um, it turns out that that's too strong a condition in many cases. So what I want to tell you today is about some new things, this a paper that we just submitted, um, that I'm going to have three conditions that, that, that sort of weaken this polyadol passivity inequality. Ah, did that happen to me or my computer? OK. Is it showing everything? Not yet. I think it's your, OK, good. OK, so maybe just using the clicker is not enough to make it happy. OK. So, um, so um, with the first condition I'm going to do is I'm going to say, suppose that instead of saying that the gradient square is bigger or equal than a linear function of L, I'm going to say that the gradient square is bigger or equal than a class of k infinity, alpha of class k infinity applied to L. To remind you, for those of you that are not so familiar with these things, a function of class k infinity is like the blue graph in here. It's a function which is 0 at 0, it's continuous, and it goes to infinity as the argument goes to infinity. It's a function of the positive reals and positive reals, okay? Non-negative reals and non-negative reals. A function of class k is one like the green one, is one that is, is, uh, is non-decreasing, actually it could be even strictly increasing if you want, but it has in at a certain value, so it doesn't necessarily go to infinity. I mean, obviously, a function of class k is, is a function of class k infinity is also class k. And finally, a function that is positive definite is one that is always positive except at zero, but it doesn't necessarily be, it's not necessarily monotonic. And in particular, what's important is it can go to zero at infinity. So uh, what I want to point out is that the typical, like I said, the typical uh, statement of uh, Lohasevich inequality is actually with a constant that depends on a sublevel set. Okay? And it turns out you can prove that that's equivalent to this kind of estimate, having a positive definite estimate. It takes a little bit of work. It's like trivial. It's like the comparison uh, against. Uh, the K condition is actually related to something called the Kuriel of Hatsiewicz inequality. I don't know how many people here work in numerical analysis and optimization, but this is something that's become very popular lately. Um, I mean, you can show that this is equivalent in some way uh, to the global. I don't need that, but it's just a reminder. Um, so, what does this have to do with anything? Okay, so here we come to, I think, the, with the effect of inputs. I haven't talked about inputs yet, okay? So now, suppose that, now I'm going to slow down because this is important. Suppose that we have a, uh, we want to optimize the loss function L, but we don't actually have a form for the system. We don't have the equations, we don't have anything to actually L given in some algebraic form. So we can't really compute the grade. In fact, we can't even compute L at the particular point at which we are. But let's assume that we have some sort of oracle or digital twin or computing subsystem or whatever you want that we can query with an X. You know, depends on where we are in the state space. In the, in the uh, X will be this, you know, L is the loss function, the loss function of X, and we're trying to minimize that over X's in some sense. Uh, and this guy gives us back an estimate of the gradient, but with an L. Now, the error could come from many different reasons. For example, it could be an adversary that is trying to screw up our computation of the gradient or the function itself. Uh, it may be, you know, this oracle is imperfect. Maybe we simulate, an, an example I'm going to give you in a second is the dynamical systems example, the LQR problem. Maybe we actually simulate in the system, but we only do it over a finite horizon because we can't do it in infinity. We're so many in the time of the control problem, but we only do it on a finite horizon, and we, so that gives you an approximation of the actual cost. Or maybe in the context of what is called now uh, reproducibility and optimization, which is a big topic right now. Anybody here works on reproducibility and optimization? I know I attended a lecture at MIT about this not long ago, so one of the people in Linz was working on this. Um, so the reproducibility and optimization com uh, question comes from the fact that we use stochastic algorithms uh, typically. And, you know, Chuchu is running a lot of them, and I'm running a lot of them. We're doing different runs, and we use different seeds. That's what we're talking today about the seeds, and, you know, random seeds. We may get different results, right? So you could think of the variation between results as some sort of disturbance on the, some ideal thing that you would have. So, uh, so the way I want to model this as a simple first thing is I want to say, well, I model this as my gradient system in black, but I want to add an input. And this input will be some sort of disturbance. And again, this disturbance could come from Stochastic effects could come from could come from the fact that we have a um, is it actually not yet okay just a second okay it's sort of bad. yes okay good I don't know how, why it keeps doing this. anyway so if we um, so we have this we have this input right that we could think in many ways and then the natural question we ask we can ask is there a graceful degradation when there's this input. If there's no input, we're draining the set, everything works fine. But what about if we have this input? For example, we may ask, 
during the gradient descent, do I have overshoots that are very bad compared to the optimum? You know, I'm converging to the optimum, but because of these disturbances, I may, you know, I'm not converging in a monotone way anymore. Okay? Maybe I have some overshoots. Also, of course, I could ask asymptotically. Do I get within some reasonable distance from the, from the optimum? So one way to model this, of course, if, you know, because it's me, you know, I thought of this problem, obviously. For me, so obviously, I didn't put the state stability. I'm sorry, but for me, that's sort of obvious. Okay, that's one, one way to formalize the problem. So uh, we might ask, you know, is it, is it possible when I look at the system that, uh, you know, I get an estimate that tells me that the loss at any time t is bounded by basically a sum of two terms. You could think as maximum, it doesn't matter, any increasing function of both. But let's say a sum of two terms, one of which tells me something about the transient is and bounds the overshoot. The other one tells me, and as t goes to infinity, this term goes to zero. This is what is called a function of class KL. And as, which in particular means it goes to zero, it goes to infinity, it's class k in the first argument, and you end up with an asymptotic bound, which in some senses is proportional to the, uh, to the magnitude of the, of the noise. Now here I'm using a soup norm, but you could also have an integral L1 or a weighted L1 or some kind of more abstract integral norms where you know, you're sort of looking at the average effect in some sense of, the, of these errors in computation that you made or arbitrary effects. And that is what is called integral input to state stability, you know about that. So the key thing is that, uh, yeah, I'm going I'm to have to skip all this, which is actually going into the details of the, yeah, I'll have to skip the details, but um, about gauge functions and so forth. But I have a system that control paper, uh, letters paper about this not too long ago. Uh, but basically, uh, let me just tell you what the, uh, what the main result is. Yeah, so the main result is very roughly as follows. The main result is if I have a polynomial of a series type inequality with a k infinity bound, which for instance a global of a series inequality would have that, then you get normal or good old input to state stability. If you have a positive definite function, then you get integral input to state stability. If you have a function of class k, you get basically input to state stability but with a bound on the controls. Not for arbitrary controls, but controls that are bounded by something that is less basic than the symptomatic value of the k function. Okay? So that's sort of to you know wrap with the general story of that is. And then the motive, the reason I did all this was I was very interested in a, I think I heard the lecture here at MIT too. Somebody was talking about uh, 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 the direct gradient estimation in linear product control problems. In linear product control problems, uh, you, you know, of course, you could solve a Riccati equation and whatever you want, but uh, if a system is not known perfectly and you want to do some sort of say reinforcement learning, where you're given a linear, at any time, let's say, uh, the value, say you, you guess the feedback matrix K, okay, so linear control is going to rise on the solution was given by a linear feedback matrix. You have that linear feedback matrix, you fit it into some simulator or something, get an idea of what your value is, okay, and use that, and use the gradient computed from there to be able to then decide how to keep up with this. And so you have a gradient descent on these matrices, and this actually goes back, you know, 53 years uh, to think of these things in this sort of model free operation optimization. And what we proved recently is a paper that is just submitted uh, with uh, a group at NYU is that V is actually a class K loss function, which means that the system is essentially uh, input, uh, input to state stable with respect to, uh, to um, to, uh, to, to at least small, what we call small inputs. Uh, and I want to point out that the, the results that were available before that did not have anything like this. Only had basically a positive definite, which, which would only would give you an integral input to state stability, which is far weaker. So, anybody's interested, I can tell you more about all this. Uh, I'm very excited about this. And also, we have results in the same paper for Newton flows and natural gradients, which are a version of gradients given a Riemannian metric. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip this because I want to, if I have a little bit of time, I want to tell you a little bit about some other research I'm doing and also uh, want to point out why I'm particularly happy to be in this talk at MIT. So, um, we all know about neural networks and classification. Uh, and to pick a random, I want to, I want to point out, that's a little bit of funny thing, that if you take a random paper of 51 years ago, uh, happens to be a book I wrote, in Argentina in the year 1972. Uh, I was actually looking at, looking at neural networks and I was interested in understanding learning in neural networks and I was talking about pattern recognition, I was talking about 
how input features matter, and that's what you would actually put as inputs, how weights in neural networks were neural networks at that time, they were not hidden units, right? People were thinking of perceptions. Okay, so you couldn't do that much compared to what you could do with you know, deep networks or even one human layer, right? But it was interesting that we were talking about things such as adjusting weights by stochastic gradient descent. And in fact, we had a research group in Argentina working on doing stochastic gradient research, uh, descent for learning neural networks, basically, okay? Uh, this is 1970, well, the, the group was 1969 to 1972, then after Argentina to come study in the United States. And what was interesting for me is in 1972, I was admitted by Marvin Minsky to come study here for my PhD in AI uh, <laughs> at MIT. I ended up going to Kahneman in Florida to study control theory instead. I'm not sure now which was the best career choice, but it was interesting that I was actually going to come to MIT to, to do AI. Um, and, and this was actually, it was funny, I just, I found this article, well I had it, but I scanned it recently, that appeared in the main newspaper in Argentina, the La Nación is the main newspaper in Argentina, still exists, where they were interviewing me about the research we were doing, and I was talking there about how I was saying, if you know, you, you can, lay, I can send this to you if you want, you can zoom in, uh, how sentience might be possible in neural networks in the future, in artificial intelligence in the future, not necessarily neural networks, how AI would solve most major problems in science, how it's probably the most powerful technology ever, and how we needed people to help us understand what the limits should be for artificial intelligence. So this was 51 years ago. <laughs> I thought it was sort of cool. Anyway, but to be more precise, let me talk about one very quick mathematical problem. Uh, so, suppose that we want to uh, train a neural network, let's say a single hidden layer neural network, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what, in the face of it, is a totally stupid problem. Like, come on, why would anybody study that? Let's consider the case in which the, uh, the activation functions are linear. No, yes, you heard wrong. The activation functions are linear, okay? So theta is linear. No hyperbolic tangent, no radius, no nothing, just linear, okay? So, of course, what you're doing in that case, you're computing a product of two matrices, right? Okay? So, if you're going to do a fitting, uh, you're going to do a fitting basically into a, let's say, if you do a regression of some sort, you want to, want, you want to get y, the outputs, to be w2 times w1 x1, w2 and w1 are the weights in the, in the second and the first layer, respectively. Are we all okay with that? Just standard, deep level, standard, you know, hidden layer neural network where we have linear activations. All right. So, now, clearly, especially in the case of linear units, there's a huge symmetry group, right? Because if you have GLN acting in the middle, you can, you can do any invertible change of transformations in the middle, so you have a huge non-uniqueness. And in the case of non-linear activation, the non-uniqueness is much less, as you know, but there's still you know, there's still no uniqueness. It's a two to the n times n factorial type of, uh, of group acting instead of a continuous group. But this work, by the way, with colleagues at Northeastern. Um, so, um, why do we want to study this question? Well, one of them is to understand the question of overparameterization. I'll say one word about that uh, later. Uh, but more important than that, I want to, again, going back to the story I was just telling you, I want to study the effect of disturbances in a gradient descent learning. So, let's understand what I mean by that. So. Let's go to the problem and let's assume that, you know, I just have, you know, the simplest, the simplest case where x, the inputs is just the identity. Then all I want to do is I want to do the following stupid thing. I want to take a matrix y and I'll write it as a product of two matrices. I have a matrix, I'm going to write it as a product of two matrices. Well, obviously I can do it in a linear way, right? And let's say I want to do what? Well, actually, not a linear, but a continuously infinite number of ways, okay? Because what I said, the general linear group. So, but what I want to do is I want to ask a little bit of, well, but what about if we do gradient descent? What about if we do uh, propagation, okay? Just gradient descent and chain rule, right? So anyway, what about if we want to do gradient descent? So we want to do gradient descent. Uh, we look at the gradient, and the gradient, you know, you just compute the gradient using the Frobenius norm for the difference between y and pq. And, you know, we, we have this, you know, this particular set of equations, but I'm also going to assume I'm interested because what I'm interested in is what happens if this gradient is noisy. That's actually got me into this problem. Okay? Other people have been looking at this problem in general, uh, although it turns out there's a lot of open problems, as I'll tell you in a minute. So when there is no U and V, we know that there's generic convergence to, uh, to, the, to the target set where Y is to the error is zero. I mean, that's known. There's a lot of references in here that have to go over. Don't go over. But the main theorem is that you have a dissipation inequality 
but there's this term in the dissipation inequality which is not necessarily bounded away from zero. So you don't get, even if you have no inputs, you don't get a nice exponential stability because this, this is uh, singular values of the Q and P matrix along the trajectory, it's time varying and it could also get very close to zero. So you don't have a good exponential rate of convergence. So the question is, can we understand a little the dynamics of this system? And let me tell you the simplest example, which is the case in which we have dimension one for uh, x and y. So all I'm trying to do is I'm doing the following thing. I give you a number, call it y, and I want to factor it as the product of two numbers, p and q. y equals p times q. Now what could be easier than that? Of course, I can write y times 1, I can write 2y plus 1 half, I can do, and, you know, infinite many things, right? But suppose I follow gradient descent. When you write the gradient descent equations, it turns out the equations are the following form. This y minus pq is a scalar. So in fact, if you erase that, you actually have a standard linear saddle, right? The linear system is a saddle, so you draw the picture for the saddle. But when y, but there's this term of this nonlinear term, this nonlinear term can be zero. When it's zero, you're actually creating a disconnected set of equilibria. Okay, so this is not gonna satisfy right away your, your assumptions. Uh, you have a disconnected set of equilibria given by these two branches of a hyperbola. And the vector field changes direction, right? Where y minus pq is negative, you change direction of the vector field. So this is really what the vector field looks like. And you can actually show global convergence to the green thing, which is the target, except for that saddle, the stable manifold of that saddle. Okay? So I can actually prove a theorem that says, you know, it just it takes a little bit of work, and I'm not going to have time to do it, but basically there's an input to state stability theorem. Uh, that, you know, there's a dissipation inequality that gives you an input to state stability theorem, as long as you are in a region that I don't have time to show you now in the picture, but there was a region in the picture you can show. As long as you're a little bit away from that cell, you have an input to state stability condition, which says that you have the robustness with respect to errors in the gradient. Now, we still don't know how to prove this, how to get similar results in the general case of arbitrary dimensions. Um, there's, you know, there's a couple of little things that we have, but it's I won't have time to go over, and it's probably not worth spending time with that, right? So I'm going to skip that. Let me just say to finish um, that, well, first of all, thank you very much for <laughs> the invitation, the opportunity of talking about all these things. But what did I talk about? I talked about how qualitative uh, features, uh, features of, a, of the response can help you distinguish between different models in biology. So in particular, we looked at you know, things like monotonicity of response and how they help us invalidate the model in, um, in a hypoxic response in, 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 um, in tuberculosis. Um, we talked about this uh, thing about the odor sensing in worms and how the subharmonic responses, because of a the theorem, help you uh, uh, both is an adaptive system, so we don't know if it's an incoherent negative feedback loop or free forward loop, but because we get subharmonic responses, we know that it cannot be feed forward, it has to be a feedback loop. Um, I talked a little bit about the general question of scale invariance, sometimes also called fault change detection. I didn't have time in that slide to explain why it's called that, but basically you just, if things are equally scaled, you don't detect the difference. You only detect the difference if the scales are different. So that's why instead of talking about invariance, you can talk about what you detect, which is the differences, okay? Or tolerant to is invariant. There's a rich the mathematical theory. You get this certificate, this necessary and sufficient certificate for validating it. And there's experimental uh, confirmations of that. And it's used also for modeling validation, as I showed you in the, in the, uh, in the example with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the slam molds. And I talked a little bit about perturbed gradient flows, uh, about how you introduce this variance of the uh, polyacrylic uh, inequality uh, estimates of gradient dominance. And this new variance, maybe they're not terribly interesting. We're just looking at a single gradient descent. But once you have inputs, those variants become very important. For example, the K version, the class K version of that gives you this input to say stability with bounded inputs kind of result, okay? And the positive definite version of that gives you integral input to say stability. So those are tools that you may find useful, you know, if you're doing any analysis like this. I think that computer scientists should really pay attention to some of these dynamical questions uh, having to do with how, you know, how inputs, how, what the transient behaviors are during training, especially if you have some sort of disturbance. And I give you in particular very quickly this idea about, there's a typo there, anyway, about uh, <laughs> neural network learning. I think something got killed there uh, for neural networks. So anyway, so that was it. There's, you can scan that for uh, where all the papers are, so you know, if you're interested. But uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you.